if you double the population and uh, and and ADX the money supply and increase the global cooperation and trade, what happens? Hello, everyone. Today, our guest is CEO of Market Disruptor, famous investor and YouTuber Mark Moss. In this video, Mark Moss shares his thoughts on communism, capitalism, money, and liberty of property and money. If you enjoy this highlight videos, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you. According to Mark Moss, the CEO of Market Disruptor, significant regulation is coming to the cryptocurrency industry following the aftermath of FTX collapse. He believes that future cryptocurrency bull runs probably won't happen. However, Moss says that Bitcoin will continue to see demand as it is solving a problem that has plagued humanity from day one. So I think um, the first thing with the Communist Manifesto, the, the, the first part that really stuck out to me was he says, to summarize communism in one statement is the abolition of private property. So to your point, these kids in, in, in college, they don't realize it's like, oh, I don't own anything. And so that right there, I mean, we could sit there and unpack just that piece, but it's like, what is private property? Why is private property important? How does private property help people and humanities and, and whatnot? And so the abolition of it, just get rid of it altogether. And so there's, I think, a big misunderstanding of even what that means. So for example, I believe that my body is my private property. Mm -hmm. You can't make me move my arm, only I can, right? Um, and so then, um, if I had a rare form of diabetes where I can't store fat on my body, then I'd have to eat 24 seven, right? But if I can store a little bit of fat, that's like a battery. And so now I don't have to eat for the next couple of days, I could burn off my fat. When I'm expending energy, thinking, working, digging holes, whatever, I'm expending my life's energy, my battery. And let's say that I dig for four hours a day and I earn enough to provide for my needs for that day. So every day I have to work four hours to get enough food or shelter to live. Well, let's say that I decide to work an extra four hours. Where do I store that? That's my energy I expended. I need to store that so money could be like this storage of energy, which then allows me to not work tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So it's a battery. It's where I store my wealth. Well, that's my life I've given up. And then if I work long enough, I could buy a cow. And now that cow allows me to live longer. This house provides me shelter. And those are my, that's my battery. That's what allows for self-preservation. And then it allows me to start thinking long term. So if you strip away all private property, I mean, where does that leave society? Of course, as Bitcoiners, we talk about this long time perspective, yeah. you know, all the time. So I think that was the first statement that shocked me, which is ab uh, abolition of private property. So given him the benefit of the doubt, why did he want to get rid of private property? Well, what happened is, if you understand the way the world kind of developed through lots of systems, but specifically, um, he wrote this right at the, just after the Industrial Revolution started. Okay. Okay, previous to the Industrial Revolution, there was no machines. So the whole world operated on farms. Um, people kind of have this uh, Game of Thrones vision of the world, and they don't realize that's not really how it was because it was very difficult to even have food back then. And so they had to grind wheat, and it could take thousands of people just to grind enough wheat for people to live. So like just to stay alive was very difficult. But machines enabled them to move past that. So all of a sudden, the Industrial Revolution gave them a machine could do the work of 5,000 men, which then freed up work, which then they could focus on technology and science and medicine, things like that. So that, that's where he wrote it. So everybody basically lived on the farm where I had to make my own clothes and make my own food and all these things. There was no specialization of labor yet. Yeah. All right. And so what happened is we kind of went from like this feudal society where people had money. And then we go into this kind of industrial society where then the rich people started building up factories and, and stuff like that. Now, I would imagine you had uh, in a, in a farm, my father grew up on a farm um, in Iowa, and it was it's a tough life, right? Uh, my father would basically get loaned out to other farmers to help them bring their crops in, right? Everybody, all hands on deck. The kids worked in the fields or worked in the kitchen with their mom, and so I would imagine that people, families, moved from the farms directly into the factories. That's just what they did, right? I would also imagine that uh, factories were probably pretty unsafe. At the time, they just invented machines. They probably broke down all the time, right? There's probably lots of accidents happening. So I would imagine all those things were happening. And he said that the it was he, he, he made the pitted two groups, right? The rich and the poor, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. And he said that the poor, the proletariat, have nothing to offer but their labor. And their labor will never equate to capital. Hmm. So no matter what the poor do, they're never going to have any capital. And the rich people that have the capital are always going to be oppressing and holding them down. 
And I, I believe that's just false, right? I believe, and, and maybe it was also indicative of the time. So we didn't have specialization of labor. So um, today we have intellectual capital, right? We have mm. ideas. We have more than just our labor, right? Um, he was mad at the world that he couldn't provide for his family writing philosophy. So if you know about him, he came from mm -hmm. a very wealthy family. His parents were attorneys. His wife's family was very well-to-do as well. Um, he had, I believe, eight kids. And um, he wanted to, he didn't want to be an attorney. He wanted to just write philosophy. But no, the world didn't value that. And so he couldn't provide for his family. He was a horrible father. I believe four of his eight kids died, mm -hmm. uh, malnutrition, disease, et cetera. Um, but think about the irony here. It's actually capitalism that's allowed for the specializ specialization of labor that actually values philosophy today. Um, yeah, but what is it you, if, if you're worried about this, what is the alternative? What do you want? Well, I believe that capitalism is natural and emergent process that humans go through. Yes. And so um, naturally we're trying to, we already talked about, we're trying to innovate. We're trying to use our scarce resources better. I used to carry one rock at a time. Then I created a wheelbarrow and allows me to carry 10 rocks at a time. And I killed an animal, you had a fire. Hey, Peter, you got a fire. Can I cook my animal? We'll share, we'll exchange, right? So it's, it's private property rights. It's free and voluntary exchange. It's natural emergent. Little kids in school are doing capitalism. They're trading sandwiches for chips. In North Korea, in prison, they're tr doing capitalism and they're trading cigarettes for onions in the kitchen or whatever it is. And so um, capitalism is a natural emergent process where I have my private property and we free and voluntarily exchange those goods. But I also believe the state is a natural emergent, well, it's, a, it's a natural monopoly. Well, it's a monopoly. It's not it's natural. A, but, I, but I think it is. I, th I think you cannot stop it from happening. This is my point. It's like when people are like, oh, you're a statist. It's not like I, I disagree with you. I think when you outline- Have you ever read world, Murray Rothbard's The State? I, Anatomy yeah, of the State? A, a long time ago. But what I, it, that's a book, right? I'm just looking at the reality of the world. We have 210 countries or 205, whatever it is. Why do, why do we have that? I think you're always going to have structures that build. It's not that I agree with it. No, I agree. We're always going to have structures. Yeah, so what are the structures we're trying to get towards? Like- I think this is a natural process. And I think what we emerge with is a natural process. Now we can disagree with parts and fight against it. No, I agree with you. So yeah. back to my homeowner association, yeah. for example, somebody has to be responsible to hire the landscaping company and mm. make sure they get paid. Someone has to be responsible to hire the security company and make sure there's somebody there and someone has to be. So someone, there's always gonna be an organizing function. We're always gonna want to assign that to some group or person, right? Uh, but I think it'll be done on a much smaller level, more but, of like uh, But how do you establish, the, you know, I always come back to it. How do you establish the rules? What is a crime? And then how do you punish crime? If you don't have a, like a set of agreed set of rules. And so if you- We do have a agreed set of rules. So for example, if I go into Disney World, yes, I have to pay to gain admission to Disney World. I yes. get access to everything that Disney World has. Um, they have their own security. They have their set of rules. Okay. If I don't follow those rules at Disney World, they kick me out, right? They have their own security force, et cetera. But once I leave, those rules for Disney World don't apply me to over here, right? What, what, if, what if I come onto your land and kick you off it I come with my friends and my guns and kick you off it. Okay. So that's what is so, your re what is your right. recourse? Okay. So back to the anatomy of the state or Bet Bastiat's the law. If you read those books, which are both what, by I've the got, way, got I recommend yeah. to everybody listening. Those are like 45 minute books. You should Bastien read them. Well. So um, basically what happens is um, the way that they're broken down the book. And I believe is that I am back to the Communist manifesto abolition of private property. Uh, we say in the Uncommerce manifesto, the absolute preservation of private property. So it's my private property and I should have the right to defend my private property. So I believe that the only reason why force is valid is in order to defend my private property. Mm -hmm. And if I believe that, then collectively you and I could team together. If somebody's trying to come steal my property, you and I could work together to defend my property. But what if I beat you and I got your property? I mean, then we, so, okay, so I haven't finished. So then the next step is then collectively, um, the, there is no such thing as a state. There's only individuals, but as individuals, we can collectively come together in shared interest. So for example, this is what happens. So then we have a village and the village is teaming together to defend our private property. And then we make a kingdom and a country and the country is supposed to defend people's private property rights. But how does the country establish it's hierarchy. We ascribe we ascribe those private property, the protection of private property to this body, this state. But I believe that the only reason force is valid should be to defend my private property. And therefore the state should only have power to defend private property. Okay, but how do you stop then the scope creep? Because I, I, it's, it's not that I don't agree with you, 
but then you're going to have new rules. Oh, this happened, so we need another rule. Okay, how are we going to how are we going to arbitrage get uh, arbitrate these rules? We'll have to have a court. How, who gives the court authority? And this well, is the point. It's like I think you can burn down and you can start again. I think you always end up the same place, but you either end up with a Western liberal democracy or you end up with uh, a tyrannical government. Well, hmm. How do you square the circle with that uh, the midterms? Because do you, I mean, I mean, I, I'll, I, for, I'll 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 put midterms in the U.S. in one example. I think it all came down to the abortion. The, the, no. I think it did. Here, here's, here's what it came down to. Uh, all of politics in the United States comes down to one race, and that's in Pennsylvania. So we had a, <laughs> we had a celebrity doctor who was trusted and loved by the, by the left. He was a liberal TV celebrity doctor, very articulate, very smart, back, backed by Oprah. Everybody loved this guy, Dr. Oz. And the Democrats ran a guy who can't even put a sentence together. And whatever, he had a stroke, and I feel sorry for him, or whatever, but whatever. Either way, he had a stroke, he can't talk. And he beat a celebrity doctor who's educated and articulated. So that tells you, now, was that fraud? Or was it that people are so blind ideologically, they're just going to vote regardless if the guy can talk or not? It doesn't really matter. But that shows you, I think, everything you need to know about politics. What happened in Arizona? I think massive fraud. So if you look at the long-term secular trend, there's been three trends. One has been globalization. Mm -hmm. So we've increased peace, we've increased global trade, right? So um, we've also, two, we've increased the population. And three, we've increased the money supply. And all three are reversing. And all three are reversing. Mm. So if you if you double the population and, uh, and, and ADX the money supply, and increase the global cooperation and trade, what happens? Well, massive progress, mm -hmm. massive uh, massive uh, inf uh, deflation. We took $100,000 jobs, we sent them to India for 8,000 bucks, $100 parts, get them made in Asia for eight bucks. Massive deflation, which allows for massive monetary increase. But when you have depopulation de or population decline and you have deglobalization, how does the central banks create money in an inflationary environment? And the answer is they don't. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you decrease the population and you decrease the money supply and you decrease global trade, progress will slow. Do you think we're heading to better times? Uh, it depends on what you consider better. Um, the answer is probably no. I think, uh, and it depends on what you consider better. I think we've probably reached the peak of humanity for this cycle somewhere a decade ago. Right. Um, now, it's, it swings and it ebbs and flows and there's a pendulum and whatnot. Moss said that it's likely some crypto projects move offshore, but he stressed that he believes the money from U.S. investors won't follow these projects. Sure, the SEC clamps down and cryptocurrencies goes offshore to some small jurisdiction. If you enjoy this highlight videos, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you.